of all, really excited about my panel, but just listening to all of you, I'm so excited about all the incredible energy and creative uh, flow that's going on, just like he said, through this whole room. When I was first asked to put together this panel, um, I was so flattered. And I started thinking right away, who do I want, who do I want? And um, <laughs> I gotta admit, I am so, so honored to bring this panel of these women together for you because um, oh, Bruce said, <laughs> Honestly. Bruce said to me, he's like, well, I said, well, what do you want it to be? You know, I said, is it a specific kind of panel? Because I've been participating on panels a lot of the last couple of years, but they all kind of have sort of a different theme going through them. And he said, well, what would you want? And I, well, I got it. To our far right, we have Todd Davies. Todd has been a writer, uh, scripting stories for the screen, including Three Businessmen and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And she has produced films such as Revenger's Tragedy and Kurosawa documentary, The Last Emperor, as well as teaching, writing, and producing at many venues over the years. And now she helms Indie Exterminating Angel Press, and I love this, publishing books of all subjects that question dominant cultural stories in entertaining and accessible ways. So we'll have to hear more about that. There's no money in it. <laughs> and next to Todd, we have Karen Beard. Um, I've worked with Karen a number of years ago, so um, I'm really excited to have her here. Karen has been a freelancer in the Denver film industry for over 30 years in a variety of key positions, including producer and location manager on feature films, TV series, and commercials. And current sh currently, she's a production consultant at Advertising Production Resources, so she advises national clients on their broadcast and web production. So that's pretty cool. And that sounds like that does actually pay. It does. <laughs> I'm in the business end of this now, after 35 years. Also. And next we have Miriam. Uh, Miriam Ursos owns and operates Red Pine Studios right here in Boulder. And as a cinematographer, her work has appeared on Versus, Lifetime, CNN, CET, and PBS. And she's also produced three feature films in Colorado, and all just in the last couple of years. Um, Mind's Eye, Teddy Boy, and Tengu, The Immortal Blade, and has two new feature film projects currently in development. She divides her time between two true passions, shooting nature and outdoor cinematography projects, and building the strongest possible feature film industry in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. With all those projects. Did I do all that? <laughs> or you're in the process. Or with somebody else. <laughs> And right next to me, um, I had the fortunate uh, pleasure of meeting Danielle just uh, about maybe a month ago when her um, a documentary she has out in theaters right now called The Queen of Versailles screened right here in Boulder. Um, Danielle has had five films premiere at Sundance, including The Queen of Versailles, which was the opening night film and received the Grand Jury Prize for directing and is currently screening in theaters nationwide. Um, other credits include Fox Search Searchlight's Waitress, the award-winning documentary Double Dare, and the Miramax comedy Daltrey Cal Calhoun, executive produced by Quentin Tarantino. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about them, but um, I'm going to add, turn the mics over to them and ask them if you would please um, start off just kind of sharing with us um, your journey about how you got into filmmaking, into any part of the film business at all. Like, you know, was it a passion from childhood, or did you kind of trip into it, or? And we'll I always wanted to be a writer, and my parents, you know, my parents wanted me to make money, and I sort of thought maybe screenwriters made money. I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really fun, you know? I mean, I did that, and then uh, uh, I ended up being a producer mainly because the producer who was producing a script that I had written called me when I was living where I live, in Oregon, in the middle of the woods, and the producer who I won't name him, you'll all know him. Anyway, he was working for Zoetrope at the time and he called me, the phone rang, and I said, Tom, how's it going? And he said, has Canal Plus called you, Todd? And I said, Canal Plus being a funding agency in France. And I said, why the hell would Canal Plus have called me, Tom? I'm the screenwriter living in the Oregon woods. Isn't Canal Plus calling you? And there was silence on the other end of the phone and I hung up and I thought, I can do that. So that's how I became a producer. <laughs> Your turn. My turn. Um, I was going to go to Broadway. Theater major, teaching, teaching degree. Um, when I graduated from college, there were no teaching jobs. 
Um, so I started as a receptionist in an advertising agency. And I said, whoa, this is way better than any of these shows that I was working. So I started uh, at an agency, ended up at a video project, got into the freelance world, <coughs> freelanced for about 25, 30 years, working feature films in the location department, um, episodic TV that shot in Denver, ended up producing for um, a lot of commercial work, um, um, ended up a small production company for five or six years, and currently I work for APR, Advertising Production Resources. Really different kind of job for me. Um, I advise, I, this is the way I explain it. Generally you have a client, an agency, and a production company. A production consultant or a cost consultant goes over here between the agency and the production company. We talk about process, we talk about efficiencies, clients don't always understand the production end. So that's where we come in. We try to, we vet the bids, we try to explain things that are important from a, a concept standpoint and for actually more about the money and the process. That's what I talk about. And I, it's really interesting. I like it. It's unique. It's a good, um, as a, an older producer, it's a, a really nice way to sort of take it down a little bit. So it's fun. So I, I think I have a little bit of an odd pathway. I actually have a PhD and used to teach at the University of Colorado Denver um, film history. Um, used to teach film history classes there as well as American literature classes. And um, when my daughter was born in 2000, I took a little break from academia to raise her and I found out that child rearing was not the most creatively stimulating activity. <laughs> so I bought a camera. Well, I'd had a camera in grad school, but I bought another camera. And I think I was just marking time waiting for the DV revolution to come along since I was an academic staring, you know, doing everything by myself was sort of a way of life. So as I've gotten more deeply involved in filmmaking at, a, at various higher levels, you know, it becomes a collaborative activity all over again. So, and I found that very expansive, so that's nice. But uh, I've, I've always been a shooter, you know, from the beginning it was like, you know, I've lived in Boulder since 86 and, and the camera made the open space all brand new to me again and I saw the world open up in a way that I had never imagined and that's why I'm always committed to producing and shooting nature and um, science and outdoor cinematography whenever possible. Um, but uh, somehow I got into this feature film thing, which has taken me on a whole nother, like I said, large collaborative journey, which has been both fun and extremely stressful. So that's kind of my, my deal. Um, you know, I, I, I still shoot a lot. You know, I shot Conoco commercial last year, Audi, but nothing can really substitute for getting out there with your camera and shooting in your own backyard or making movies with your kid, which is another thing I'm enjoying now. I started specifically working in documentaries. Um, I was mentored by a filmmaker in San Francisco, and we were working on a series of documentaries kind of chronicling the history of the reproductive rights movement. Um, and so I got to it just, I, I was still actually in school working for her full time, and I came to it because um, I wanted to change the world. And I was enjoying that. I really liked documentaries. But then I, I kind of, by accident, fell into doing fiction filmmaking. Um, uh, someone came to me and said, oh, I have a friend. He wrote a script. He wants to make this movie. And you're the only producer I know. And she didn't really know the difference between doc and fiction. And, um, and she introduced me. And, and Lots he was of people don't. Yeah. <laughs> He was a really interesting filmmaker at the time. I was really young and naive, which I think was a huge plus, actually, because if I would have known how hard it was, I don't think I would have ever done it. It's probably um, how all of us got into it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was suckers. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and at that point, I was grappling with what I was going to do next. Did I want to go to film school? What did I want to do? So this, I kind of rolled the dice, and I ended up, you know, we thought we would raise the money in three months and we would be shooting. It took over a year and it was a real struggle. And we, but I was learning a lot. And it was a film about the San Francisco rave scene and DJ culture. And because we were so low budget too, it was kind of like a doc where you were using people from that scene, real people. You were, you know, people that decorate parties that are DJs and so you kind of you had to gain their <coughs> trust much like when you're making a documentary and you're trying to gain the trust of your subject matter and and so man, many of my skills did translate um, but it's still especially raising money was very different before I had you know written grants but this time we were you know making a business plan and it was 
late 90s and really trying to model it off of um, like a dot com, which at that point, you know, in the Bay Area was, you know, what everybody was thinking about. Um, so that film, we raised $250,000. We ended up shooting it without having our money for post, which I would never do again, and I can't oh. believe I did it. But um, we, and this will show my age too, we took, um, after we had a cut of the film, because the director, thankfully, was also an amazing editor, and we submitted a VHS tape of it to Sundance. You know, oh. we like mailed it down, and lo and behold, we got in. And the movie did really well for me. I mean, it didn't do gangbusters at the box office, but it was the first film. This was in 2000. It was the first film that sold. It sold for a lot of money. I owned a lot of the movie because we had worked on it and not really taken any salaries. And, and a, um, you know, that all of a sudden I thought, oh, it's not that hard to make a movie. This is kind of fun. And then, and then I've had much pain since that time. Um, so I've, I've made a handful of fiction films, and some of them that I'm really proud of, you guys will have no idea what they are. And then other ones, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a bit arbitrary, I think, in some ways. And um, so I've always stayed involved in the documentary world. I've always kind of kept one foot in the fiction world and one foot in the doc world and to me I've always really enjoyed that because I feel like it exercises different parts of your brain and when you think you're gonna kill yourself working with actors and you work with real people and then you work with them and you're like it's so frustrating I don't know what they're doing I don't know what they're gonna say because there's no script <laughs> and then you get to you know so you kind of go back and forth and and so I've been lucky enough to work with filmmakers. Admit it they're much nicer than actors. <laughs> <laughs> I've Admit had it. Some, I've had some good <laughs> and hard experiences with, with both. So that's kind of how I got into it. Um, thanks. I love the fact that it's not, that it's like, well, okay, I knew I wanted to be in filmmaking, and I went to film school, and here I am. You know, it's it's just, it's definitely a journey. So Bruce was talking about even just saying about how, like, oh, if this is something we want to do on a regular basis, and um, traveling to film festivals um, over the last couple of years, I have had the conversation come up about whether having women, you know, women panels and such is um, actually kind of counterproductive. Um, I have my own personal opinion, but I, yeah, I'd love to hear um, some of your, uh, just the fact that, like, trying to establish yourselves. All right, Todd, you're starting. <laughs> well, I, I just remember my first husband, <laughs> when I would go to a woman's, uh, what do you call it, a woman's clinic? And I would come home and he would say, why isn't there a men's clinic? And I would say, well, there is, darling. It's called the AMA. <laughs> and that's really true. You know, I'm, I, I really don't think it's very weird to have a women's panel. I think it's really quite useful. Um, because I think that women and women's values aren't really being represented enough, not just in film, but in the culture generally. Even though we're sort of pretending that that's not happening. We're all pretending that we all have made these huge strides. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. We made huge strides. We get to act like fake men. <laughs> Yippee. But really, um, am I going to repeat myself if, this, if I say a lot of stuff in my blog? Can I repeat the flight or fight thing? Okay, yes. you know, you know, there was a, uh, there were, you know, did you guys all get taught in science class about how when we are all stressed, human beings have two responses: we either fly or we fight, right? Okay, so there were these two women scientists who were like really freaked out and stressed in their their scientific laboratory, and they were like meeting all the time to have drinks together and laughing really hard, and then one day one of them went, "Wait a minute, we're really stressed. Why aren't we flying or fighting?" So they went and they looked at the research and they found out that there was not a single woman who had been looked at in that research, not one. So they went back and they did it again, all with women. And what they discovered was women, when they are stressed, join together with other women to hang out or take care of children. This is an entirely different thing than flying or fighting, is it not? Yeah. Okay, so my perspective is that that perspective is not being brought so much to the culture. The movie business, especially, it is not being brought to. We are all pretending that we got to fly or fight and we have to like 
beat nature down to the ground when we are moving into the, the film business. But why is that so? Why should we not be supporting each other, having a good time, thinking about ways to deal with the kids? Why not? I mean, we shouldn't get rid of the other half, but why is it only half? So that's what I think. That's a, that's a tough comment to follow, I'll yeah. tell you. Personally, I think uh, knowledge is power. Any kind of knowledge you can get at any time from any source, take it, use it, run with it. That's all pretty straightforward. It's all good. And all women's knowledge yeah. should be in there. Yeah, it, all of it. Well, I'll tackle this one kind of from a shooter's perspective, actually, because I mean, I, what I've found is I love shooting boys. I love boys who shoot. I mean, that is my, the be, they're the best guys in the world are the guys running cameras because they're smart, they're technically savvy, they work their tails off every day. I love hanging out with shooting boys and men and, you know, whatever they are. They're all boys to me. They all drive <laughs> me too, don't no, they? No, they really are earnest and hardworking and those are, my, those are my peeps. I love them. But there's always something that, a little bit different when you know, like when my friend Jesse, who runs audio, walks on set. I'm like, yay! And she's like, yay! And we're like, yay! Um, <laughs> because, you know, another techie female has arrived, you know, to, to play. You know, so it, it just, there's just an element of fun to it that, that you know, is, it becomes more vital to me as I, as I get older. I just really, you know, enjoy it. And I know my friends that are female that are in the tech fields know that they're doing something that is... Um, you know, n slightly non-conforming still. So, you know, you just know it by the people that you see. And like I said, everybody, it's just fun. Why is it non-conforming? Just look at the numbers, you know. This no, is no, but what, what do you think causes that? What do I think is the root source of that? Um, I think it just goes back to the same numbers that we see about, you know, young girls and the sciences in general. And I think technology is, you know, part of that, that we don't teach our, our daughters that it's fun to be geeks. We don't buy them little science kits and we don't buy them little cameras unless you're my daughter, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> she has several. But, I, I, but I, I think it comes down to that. I mean, even, and I would say I, I've had my own biases, you know, I was just working on a, a set of a feature film where, there was this young woman who really had it going on and I really liked her and we got together and I was like, oh, you should you know, come work on the production side and be a producer. And, and why did I say that? What I learned later is that she's a really good shooter. And my first assumption was because she had a lot of organizational skills was that she too should work in production. But once I saw her, you know, and, and all, she was very modest about her shooting and I think that modesty, you know, is that self-effacement is, is, is part of the deal that we don't come out and say, hey, I'm an awesome shooter. You know, I, I, I find it somewhat odd that the thing I've gotten more notoriety for is my producing um, because it's high visibility, it's high profile, and females do it, and therefore it's okay when really I've shot for way longer than I've produced. And, um, you know, at, at, at what is a pretty high level, I've shot for Nova and I've shot for these high-end commercial things and, um, you know, TV and all these, these things that come around. But really what I'm known for is producing. And I think that's because it's okay to have somewhat gray-haired matriarch at the helm, you know, as a producer. But, you know, even on the set, like I said, sometimes the boys are like, can I carry that for you? And I'm like, no, I mean, schlepping 80 pounds of camera gear around is like, it's what we do. You know, and they and they have a lot of respect for me. And like I said, they're they're my boys, and I love them. But there is a, a different world when another techie girl walks on the set, and we're like, yay, yay. You know, and I invite also any of you who happen to be techie girls to you know come talk to me because I like to as a producer, I do like to employ those people. I mean, and and you know, it's it's it can be very hard to break into. It, it's a relationship driven business. And, you know, it is a very frat house kind of oriented business, too, especially on sets. You know, you listen to a lot of, you know, just kind of trash talk and this and that and the other. And, and it's just part of the, the environment. It's part of the milieu. It's part of the fun, actually. Um, you know, I was, I was r wrangling some data on a, on a very high-end commercial, and um, the DP walks up to me and he said, did you think that stuff I shot with the DSLR was sexy? And I was like, eh, it's, you know, it was... It was pretty good. There was some really good stuff in there. You know, mixed bag. And he was like, did your nipples get hard? And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, Dave, I'm 48. <laughs> Say no more.
Um, I feel really fortunate because I feel like I oftentimes work with many women and actually the bulk of DPs I've worked with are women. Um, so, it, and, and looking at the numbers, that's not the norm. I understand that. Um, but I do think in documentaries, the number of women are, you know, that are directing and producing and DPing and stuff are much higher than in fiction films. Um, but I did have a, f a fiction film that actually was at Sundance. It was shot by this amazing DP named Nancy Schreiber. Um, and she mm -hmm. won. Yeah, well, yeah, nice you woman. should you know her. Everybody should know her. But she's, like, really a trailblazer, you know. And she won the Cinematographer Award at Sundance, you know. And she was up against, you know, Fred Elms or, like, all you know, all these big old-timer guys. So I've been very fortunate in that way that I feel like, and I don't know if it's because I'm producing and I'm, you know, making those decisions about who to hire, but, you know, in the in the doc world too, like, you know, I have a long list of DPs that I work with and the two top people or three on my list are women and it's not because they're women, it just happens to be like, I like their shooting, I like, like you know. I do have to say something here though. Yeah which is my dear husband who is here, who is a film director. We were talking before this, and I was saying that Miriam was, I talked about your blog to him and about how you were saying that there were no other women that had gone for the red camera. And he went, oh God, that's true, isn't it? There aren't that many female DPs. And he goes, Nancy Schreiber? Yeah, <laughs> the one name. Well, I was lucky I got to work with her. Yeah. But she was mentoring younger female shooters that were working and that were getting, you know, hours on our film and that kind of thing. You know, I think she, she's very conscientious of that. Um, but so I'm not, I'm not saying it's not tough, but, you know, from my experience, I, I've had really positive experience with working with women and I've worked with a lot of them. When I, when I first started shooting, um, one thing that uh, me and a bunch of my friends did, there were like six of us, and we just got together and we did a group where we did our own little monthly shootout. And that was a really, truly valuable experience. And actually, my business started from that because I found my business partner in that group. And, you know, we launched a commercial enterprise and it all kind of ran from there. But I'm just kind of throwing it out there that it's, it's fun. There was a lot of wine involved and a fair amount of brie cheese. And, you know, we just hung out and we, we watched our little shorty films and that's how we started. But there's something about consistency and doing it regularly that will teach you more than I think almost anything else that you can do is is putting one foot in front of the other but I think a great way to start is with your friends so it's the only way so while we're on that tech subject aside from just the fact that fewer women actually go into you know on camera teams and we see fewer women there um, something Miriam you had mentioned I think it was in your blog or whatever just about the fact that so often producers are seem to have a little more faith in male um, cinematographers, could you kind of um, share a little bit about that, um, what your experience may have been or what provoked those thoughts? Well, I, you know, I don't consider myself a DP. I do consider myself a cinematographer because I think of the DP as a very specified job on a feature film set, um, you know, and that they have a knowledge about lighting that, that I don't. Usually when I'm working on a feature film set as a shooter, I'm a second camera operator in, in some regard, or I am <coughs> the producer and they won't let me touch the camera except for when they're doing second unit stuff, you know, after it's all wrapped. But So those are the capacities that when I work on a feature film set, and I don't consider myself a DP. In the documentary world, where you know the lighting setups are a little bit different, yeah, I would definitely call myself a cinematographer or even a DP. That I've done that, you know, I've helmed the look of the film and shot the film and you know all these other things, ran the team of shooters, etc. Because usually there is multi-camera setups, which I'm you know familiar with. But but I, I have had the experience of being passed over by other female producers who've even looked at my reel and said can you look at this guy's reel and tell me what you think? And I'll give them some feedback on it and then they'll go hire that person, <laughs> you know? And, but it's fine. I mean, you get passed over for jobs all the time for all kinds of reasons. It's, it's just part of, part of everything, you know? And you never really know what those reasons are, but it's, it's definitely happened. But I've, like I said, no complaints because really it's about the projects you get to work on, not the projects you don't get to work on. It's never about what the other guy's doing. It's always about what you are doing to, 
enhance and further your your craft and your skill set and your passion for what you're doing. So I, I you know like I said I, I feel kind of mixed about talking about those kind of incidences because people do get passed over for jobs for all different kinds of reasons. You get undercut by the guys down the street or you know, undersold by a film student who they then come back to you and ask you to correct all the mistakes they make or, you know, all these things that just happen. Um, but, but it's definitely happened and it's definitely been, I think, I, 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 I've had situations where I've been oddly in a competitive situation with where I'm humbly just trying to get another shooting job and, you know, uh, and I don't like those. I, I like collaboration. That's, that's the fun of this. Um, the core fun is working with other people and meeting all the amazing people that you meet with all, along the way. So, Karen, I think you need to say something. You've been silent for too long. <laughs> I was just going to go. Um, I, I would agree with your point that uh, we get jobs and we lose jobs for all kinds of different reasons. And actually, I agree with the other point you said that it's a relationship business. And so often I find um, someone may be very good at their job, whether male or female, and without that relationship piece, it's very, very difficult for them to move very far or to get very much and uh, you know, to be successful in whatever craft that they have. It's just a, it's a real challenge because you, you may be a brilliant filmmaker, but if you can't work with other people and, they can't, and you can't collaborate and you can't, if you don't have that strength, I've seen people just leave the business because they couldn't work with others. They, couldn't, they didn't play well with others, so to speak. So uh, that, that's, you know, coming from the producer world, I am that gray-haired woman who's produced, who bosses people around. My family calls it producer Karen when I start to tell them what to do on Christmas <laughs> holidays. So and I bet you weren't gray-haired to start, were you? Um, I'm going to kind of take some of your wording, Todd. Um, what women really can bring to the creative table gets shoved aside, and instead, in order to participate and produce, women are often forced to ignore their own core values and compete, not as women interested in part part partnership, but as imitation men. Um, if you could uh, kind of talk to me a little bit about that, if you all think, um, I've just sort of noticed, I think that there is a reason for to have women's um, panels and women's block of films, because not because it's we need to be set aside, but more the fact that acknowledged, honored, and so, you know, to put that to the forefront. Um, as far as what women's unique creative skills, um, do you feel that there are, like, specific things that women in general, obviously, you know, we've got, you know, men generally considered shooters and what have you, but as far as what women, in a general sense, bring to the table, um, what is getting shoved aside? Oh, I think that what Miriam was talking about, you know, the, the great love of, of it is true that, that many, many men love to work in a collaborative situation, but women really love it. And what women have a tendency to do, not all, you know, but I bet when I say this, a lot of you are gonna be going, oh yeah, that's me. We really have a, um, a tendency to go, no, you first. Oh man, you're looking good, right? Men don't have that, I mean, generally. Men, it's like, I'm first, I'm looking good, and that, it's a great thing, it moves things forward, but it's not everything, you know? There's this other thing of just what Miriam was saying and what Karen was saying, which is that it's really, really cool to like hang out together and go, this is really fun that we're doing this together. You have great skills. Oh, I love your skills. Your boots look good too, you know? That is really a good thing. Um, and I wanna say something also about what Miriam said, which is it, it's, not like, it's not like it's men that, that diss us too, I mean, I just remember when my toilet broke. I went down to the hardware store and this little girl came up to me and said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, can I talk to somebody who knows something about hardware for toilets? She went, you're looking at her. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed because I am such a feminist. She was totally right. I mean, it was a real eye opener. Of course I was looking at her. Why did I even ask about it? Um, you know, it's the dominant culture that we just think that way. We just have to get over that default setting. All of us have to get over it. It's not just men. So any suggestions on how we get over it? Just get aware of it. It's how we get over everything. It's how we grow about everything, is just try and pay attention to what you do and what you're thinking about and what actually you want to have happen in the culture. What do we want to have happen? Do we want it to be constant competition? Do we want it to be constant hierarchy and who's in top and who's in the bottom? Or do we sometimes want it to be we're all playing nice and we're thinking about what's gonna be the best life for the kids. 
Sometimes we do want that, and that's what we're trying to bring to the table. So, but we all have to be conscious about that. How are we going to make that happen? How are we not going to be unconsciously thinking, oh, the old guy with the beard is God, right? Danielle, I was kind of curious. Um, uh, with you said that you've been fortunate to have a lot of uh, women on your cruise and such, um, but outside of that, with um, you know getting going and getting distribution and um, and in other areas of it, have you um, felt challenges in that regard? Um, anything that you feel like okay, if I was part of the boys' club, this might have been a little easier, or have you been pretty fortunate in that route? Um, I don't know. I mean. I, first of all, I just moved here from Los Angeles, so I'm a little bit of fish out of water, and I'm coming, you know, from that culture. Um, but the filmmaking scene there, what I found myself thinking more is, because there's so many people everywhere, but especially in New York and L.A., who are overly educated, you know, like, it's such a competitive business, and everybody, so many people want to be in it since they're kids, it has the sense that it's larger than life, so you get so many people that are trying to be filmmakers, um, but there is, like, a, I would say, I've thought about it more in terms of money, and in terms of, you know, like, God, I wish I also went to Harvard because that's how this piece of funding came through because they saw each other at this alumni thing and then this happened. And, and so for and me... their parents played tennis with the person they got money from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, things like that. But I'm just saying, to me, I think about that much more than, oh, if I was a dude, it would be different or it would be easier. And um, maybe that's because I'm working really in the indie realm and I do think there's the proportion of women working in independent film is much greater than if you're working in the studio system. Um, but I don't feel like, I love what you're saying and I like that you're being provocative and I think that we all have to challenge us because obviously if you look at the numbers, it's crazy, you know, about the, the numbers of women that are actually directing and, and producing bigger movies. But I don't feel like I've had to, or I don't, I'm trying to think of other of my women friends that are in this business had to act like men or be like little men or what you were saying. So I don't know. I think it's complicated. But, but I do think that money plays as big of a role, really. In this business, there's so many, sorry, there's so many independent producers that you're, you're trying to figure out, like, I'm trying to figure out, can I afford childcare? Does it make sense to get onto this project? Because what am I going to have to spend to actually work on it? And then there's Do the guys have to think about that? Um, some of them might. I don't know. But a lot of independent producers, men and women, are there's, like, this thing where people don't talk about it. Actually, they are, like, secretly independently wealthy, and, and it, they're playing. You know what I mean? And I think that's a what's really hard. Choice. And until you get a little bit older, you have kids, you don't notice that as much, but then all of a sudden, or at least for me, having a kid was when everything changed, and I realized all this stuff I'm always doing on spec or helping develop this or whatever, like, there is now a price tag on each hour that I work because it's what I'm paying someone else to take care of my kids so I can give notes on your script or whatever. So that That's for me is like the, the hugest struggle for me that I'm in the thick of it right now and I'm trying to figure out how I want to navigate it. What do I want to do? How badly do I want to stay? How am I going to, you know, balance it? And it goes to, you know, I was just reading that article in the Atlantic or whatever that, that everybody's talking about, about you can't have it all. You know, women can't have it all and it's this, you know, thing that's kind of hit this cultural touch point right now. And for me, child care and, and balancing time is the number one issue. Child care would be a really good thing for everyone. Well, just another an anecdotal kind of, you know, tangent that sort of dovetails what you're saying, Danielle, is I was talking to a, I mean, I think in the producer field too, you have a different setup. I mean, in the technical fields, you have a different setup. You know, I was talking to a guy, he's a first AC, I was working with him on a job, and he's a union, he's a local 600 AC, and he's got two kids, and he's got a wife, and I said, how do you do this, because you've got two kids? And he's like, I travel all the time, like, he's never home, but he has his wife staying home and raising his two kids. You know, but he, you know, he makes good money as a, as a union AC, but, you know, he's got this, <laughs> 
this support structure that I don't have, you know, but luckily, you know, kids turn 12 eventually and you, <laughs> you kind of get freed up a little bit, but still, I mean, just kind of, I mean, I, I think, on, but on the producer side, you're worrying about, especially if you're on a, you know, a, a consecutive day shoot, you're worrying about being off for 30 days out of the year. I think that's partly why I got into producing because it's like, wow, you don't have to travel and you don't have to take out of town jobs to make good money that you can't make in Colorado, you know, but, but up to that point, you're really, you're, you're, you're tied to your child and you make all of your, your job decisions and your choices based on that up to a certain, like I said, they, they do turn 12 eventually. And it should be yeah. supported that you do that. Right, but I'm saying that, you know, his world and my world are very different and I think really are drive the choices that he's able to make versus the choices that I'm able to make on the technical side. I would just say that when I was, stuck, well, I was a freelancer for a lot of years, I worked a lot of commercials, episodic TV, much longer formats. With three kids, I used to sit and figure out that if I worked five days a month, as a script supervisor or scouting or producing, I could make as much money approximately as I, if I had worked a full-time job. So being a freelancer and an independent contractor in the commercial world provided me more money for less time. And, and then, of course, less childcare because childcare was, you know, it's tough with three. So, and then at times, from a, from a, a very personal standpoint, um, there were times in a, in a long family history where one partner's up and another partner's down. And if I happen to be working that downtime for my husband, happened when I was having an uptime with the movies. He stayed home with the kids. I worked on the movies. I was gone for months. So I think that I, it's tough, but I think that there's sometimes you can work the family with the career. It's, it's never easy. I don't think it's easy anywhere, but, you know, I didn't have a real job. I didn't think there were real jobs that paid people in this business until about, what, 10 years ago when I got a real job at a small production company because I'd never had a real job, not since I was in my 20s. So I never have. Good for you. <laughs> I'm the seller. But I don't have kids. I'm the seller. No, I don't have kids. I'm <laughs> um, kind of changing the, the direction a little bit. Do women have a particular responsibility when it comes to the stories we write, the projects we choose to develop, and the roles we choose to portray? Um, just in, again, in this uh, yearning to have, uh, to not compete, but to develop ourselves, to develop our projects, to you know, to get established as filmmakers and such. Um, is there, do we have a responsibility to, to not portray certain roles or to do not do certain types of films? I think it's more baked in than that. I mean, I think we have a responsibility to shoot the most beautiful images that we co possibly can and tell the most intriguing and compelling stories that we possibly can. And I think it just so happens that, you know, a lot of the, the stuff that I do ends up having, you know, pro female protagonists or, you know, strong images that way but women Todd artists has a different opinion no no I agree with you <laughs> which is that women artists are this I mean artists are artists you have an obligation to tell the most compelling story that you can tell not that somebody else wants you to tell that would be my point which is that women so frequently have these stories that they're compelled to tell but there's really they feel there's no market for them tell them anyway but uh, no, I don't think there's a negative thing. I don't think there's like a, we feel we should not tell, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you're going to feel it in yourself. You're not really going to particularly want to like do serial killing of women in a script. You know, it's going to make you feel gross. Don't do it. Yeah, I mean, I had to turn out, down a chance to produce a film like that. You know, the, there was the, the money was in the bank and, you know, it was a good screenplay. It was a horror film. It had a bunch of kind of lore underneath it, which elevated the genre a little bit, which I don't really find it a compelling genre. And, you know, the the co-producer was kind of ready to go on it, and I just kind of said, I cannot tell this story. I can't put my name on it, you know, because it's just, it goes so far against my beautiful planetary Earth love vibe <laughs> that I couldn't pull the trigger on it. So, I mean, I think you do have to make those choices. And it was, like I said, it would have been a big production for Colorado. It would have been a, you know, about a 
a million dollar budget, which is big for a feature film, but I just couldn't, could and not it's an, do it. And it's an individual choice, too. I mean, it's not like, you can't tell somebody else to do that, but it's like everybody's got to look at themselves and say, what do I really feel is true? Well, the funny outcome on that story was the co-producer slept on it, woke up and said, I'm glad you said that. I don't want to do it either. But <laughs> the money was a big, you know, big draw for both of us. I mean, I, I can't deny that I did let the thought of, ooh, I could put all these people to work and I could, you know, make, you know, more things happen for the people, the crew members that I like to hire. You know, there's all these things that you can do. It's not just about with money to, you know, build your community, extend your reach. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to, you know, how well will you sleep at night by doing that? I think I agree with what everybody's saying, but I kind of come to it more from, hey, it is so hard to make a movie. Usually, I would assume most people in this room, including myself, are working on really low budget stuff, rel relatively low budget, so you're not getting rich. So you gotta be getting something out of it. So, uh, something out of it more than just the paycheck most of the time. So if it's something that you're not gonna be proud of or that makes your stomach hurt, like, no, I wouldn't do it. But, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't make a slasher movie killing women, but but there are many women that work on movies like that, and I'm not going to begrudge them for it, but it's not, it wouldn't be my bag, you know, but I think as humans, we have to decide, like, what do you want to spend your time doing, you know, and, and whether you're a woman or a man, you know, like, what is it that you want to put out in the world? You know? And trusting your instincts, kind of sounds like the, the trusting within yourself, making that decision for yourself. Okay, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to, um, if you would, just one piece of advice or just one thing to the men and women in our audience, just if we haven't touched on or what have you, and then as soon as they've done that, we'll open up for questions. So who wants to start? I'll just say that this is maybe a little pessimistic, but um, I would say, like, don't do it. And then if you, and I, and, and I read this somewhere, and I don't remember who, who said this, but it's like one of those things that like if you absolutely have to do it, even though people are telling you it's dumb, you might rack up a credit card bill, you're not going to see your family, you're not going to have good retirement, you're going to not have health insurance or whatever. It's like if you still have to do it, then you should be doing it. You know, it's not, it, 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 it seems really fun and sexy, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge like everything else. I, I could say I definitely would say ditto to that. I mean, unless you're really driven, it's a very it's it's a huge amount of really hard work, and it's extraordinarily s stressful. And the higher up the food chain you go, and those hierarchies of production, the harder you know it is. I'm sure there's a turnover point, but I haven't I haven't reached that plateau yet. So I'm kind of hoping that someday. Um, but I I, th I still think I would have to temper that by saying that that the one thing that I find is given the little hothouse environments that film sets are and given the intensity, I just love it. I think it is the single most transformative thing that you can do for yourself in terms of expanding your spirit, expanding your, your creativity, um, expanding um, in all kinds of ways professionally. I just think there's something really in the transformation of film. I see kids, I bring kids all the time. I, my buddy Bob is in the back and he sent me a couple high school kids to intern on a feature film that I produced and I see those kids blossoming professionally now because they've been in this really hot house environment where they had to step up their game. And making any of these kind of big productions invites you to step up your game and there's something really powerful about that. I think making films is a really powerful teacher and it has been for me for certain. Wow, those are really, those are great. <laughs> those are just great. Um, I, I think one of the things that I'm challenged with when I talk to younger, younger folks who want to get into the business is that there's a single focus of um, what do you want to do? I want to produce, I want to direct. I'm going to school, I want to produce, I want to direct. What I try to suggest is what else is there? I mean, you may be much better suited to be an art director. You much, may be much better suited to be a DP. You know, maybe you're better, maybe when you really get in there, you're better at building sets than you are at setting a shot. So I think that, um, that Colorado is a perfect 
place to be on sets and to learn all the different crafts that are out there. When you're, if you start in LA, it's much more difficult. You got to start here. You're, if you're a PA, you're either a PA in the office or you're a PA on set, or you're an art department PA. There's, you're, you're, you're limited. If you're in Colorado, you can start with, um, you can be a PA. You learn everything. Or if you're a location person, you can see what everybody else in the in on the crew does because you interact with everybody. As a location person, you interact with the art department and the director and the, you know, you the, the guy, you know, the teamsters parking the trucks. So, you know, just look at all those opportunities. Don't, don't think the only way to, to be successful in this business. You know, if you have a, I, ha, I have to say that I, I don't, I, this is a business for me. I haven't had the passion that these women have, or that any of these have. So it has been a business and a career. So that's, that's kind of how I look at it, which is a little bit different from having to produce art. So. If you're young and you want to start making films and you're just fresh out of film school, I get thousands of kids coming to me asking for internships. And I always say, well, what, what is it you would like to be? And you know, it's always a director. Right. And uh, my advice would be, figure out what actually goes on an actual film set, not a film school short, and make yourself useful on my set. No, I don't want people shadowing when I'm at my job. I don't go to your job and pull up a chair and watch you <laughs> type. You know, I mean, make yourself useful on a set, and you're not going to be the director. Nobody will hire you. Make yourself useful on a set. Figure out what that is. You know, otherwise you will start as a PA if you're lucky you'll get some commercial gigs as a PA and see how you know bigger film sets and commercial sets are run but really figure out what has to be done on a film set and how you can make yourself useful i you know i can't emphasize that enough if you're young and getting started because you're not going to be the director so find out what you are going to be while you study and one more point to take it a little bit farther is i've never been on a film set where i haven't learned something where I haven't taken away one piece of information. Oh, look at the way they did that. I never thought of that. Maybe I can take that. So every, all of the work is valuable. Even if you don't, you know, even if you're that PA, you're going to learn something. You're going to make some connection. You're going to figure something out. You're going to see something. You're going to learn something. You're going to be able to take it to your next job. It's all, it's all good. It's all a big learning curve here. So I just have two pieces of advice. One is do not do that credit card thing, OK? <laughs> Please, no one in this room do that credit card thing because they've changed the bankruptcy laws and you can't just walk away from it. Do not do that. Did everyone get that? Thank you. And Say this, it with her right now. I will not I will break not out my credit cards. Put my film on my credit card and what I will really not do is put it on my parents' credit card. <laughs> Okay, that's only been in the last couple of years, so it may be that some people here don't know that yet. Don't do it, okay? But the main piece of advice I have, they gave you really great advice, is join, join together. I mean, it, this is not just for young people, this is for all of us. Join together with like-minded people, find what they can do and what you can do, and work together. Don't, don't try and work by yourself. And you can be a film director, so what? It's just that no one will hire you to be a film director. That's one of those gigs where you go, I am a film director. Fuck you. <laughs> you can do it, but you need other people. And you have them around you. Don't think to yourself, I need famous people. Famous people be were the way you are now, and they hung with their pals, and that's how they became famous. I was actually a um, first AD on a job a couple years ago, and um, it was a relatively name actor had come into town to shoot his first film here. And when I am brought in people I don't know, and I'll ask the PAs, I'll say, you know, well, what is your passion or what are you interested in? What have you done? Because if I can kind of place you in that area, I'd love to. And the first person was like, oh, well, you know, well, this is what I want to do, but whatever you need. Good answer. Yeah. The next person, and we're up in the mountains, and I'm just like, okay, great. Next person, and he, no kidding. His answer is like, well, what I really want to do is direct. Oh, shoot, we already have one. <laughs> 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 so it does happen. So, okay. You know, every time I hear, and uh, you know, I, I, I do want to know people's dreams, but every time a film student comes in, I know I do, I do, but the director thing for some reason just rubs me the wrong way. And every time a kid come in and say, I want to be the director, 
I always hear it as that little like uh, elf in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer who wants to be a dentist. In my head, <laughs> all I hear is, I want to be the director. <laughs> so there's just something about that that it's like, it's so sort of like you're the elf that has the unreachable profession. Go ahead. Go ahead. I really think of myself on the creative side. <laughs> Usually I just get, I want to be the director. And it's like, well, what would you do on my set? I, and they don't have an answer for that. So just find an answer for that. And, and I think the one that Mary Lee suggested is a good one. I'll do anything it takes to move this production forward. What do you need me to do? There's your answer. Thank you. You can thank me later. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for any of our panelists or all of our panelists? Barbara had asked about the diminishing roles for women. Um, so who wants to take that one? I, I think that the entire industry has changed since I've started in it. You know, when I started working, we had two-hour TV movies. They were fiction-based, and you had sitcoms, and you had hour shows. You now have reality TV. And every derivation that it is, it's cheaper to produce. It's, uh, believe, uh, people watch it. I don't understand it. But, you know, television has changed. And it, I also think it's fascinating that some of the, the best shows are no longer on network TV. You know, they're no longer on network TV, and that was always a mainstay for years. So it's, I'm, but yeah. Can I just interject one thing that yeah. you're making me think of? I mean, this is a different panel that we're not actually having right now, but cable, I mean, to me, right. that's the death of any film because those are like, the stories that you used to only be able to see at film festivals or your art house theater. Oh. So it's actually like a great thing in many ways, and it, it's not answering your question about, but I would argue that there actually are some great women-centered shows, especially in cable. But um, I mean, that kind of, in terms of the economics of it for indie film, I mean, I've, I've felt things have changed dramatically, at least in my world, like trying to raise money independently, take a movie to a market or a festival and sell it. And the audience, I don't, I think the appetite is a little bit lower because there's m more interesting storytelling that you can access now. Do you, do you find that there's more, for, for, for um, nonfiction and, um, and docs, is there a larger market now because these cable channels are buying this content now? I would say, first of all, I feel like they, they, they are talking about right now a documentary renaissance and that there are documentaries that are getting theatrical releases right now. I was very lucky to be one of them. And The Cove that came out of Boulder and, and Chasing Ice that will come out soon at some point. But um, I feel like, I mean, I have theories on that and I don't know if it's actually thanks to reality TV that it's made people more interested in real stories or what have you, or that you're just getting all these big escapist movies now so people are actually looking for something with more content in them when they go to have something to counter program against like a big blockbuster. But I do feel with, with documentaries, I don't know if there's more buyers right now or, or places to see them. I sort of feel like if you have that, you see a need, that maybe there's something in you saying create something along those lines. Because actually, you know, again, I just started directing a couple years ago and I found that's actually kind of my niche. Now, I also know that it's going to be a tough road because it's not as though people are going to say like, oh, women, oh, women's stories, women's stories. You know, it's like, okay, talk to Oprah. Um, however, I've also found that there's an audience out there and it's not all women. There, you know, I have a short six minute film that I thought for sure was going to be accepted every women's film festival because it's two women in their 40s and, um, and early 50s. And, and I can't believe the, the response I've had from men and saying we need more films like that. So um, I'd say that also, too, if you know of something, then rally behind it. If you know of a product that's out there, if there's a TV show, whatever, you know, go everywhere you can to get it back on or, again, back up something that you, you know, like one of my films, um, to make it happen. Well, I, I have a sort of a techie version. I mean, the technological landscape is changing so much, and access to, you know, the tools for production uh, it's in an unbelievable deflationary spiral, and it's and that's affected the talent too. It's a buyer's market for talent right now. You would be shocked at what you can, at who you can, you know, get to work on your productions for for how much. Because and I think you're seeing these, you know, film stars that are now working in TV and TV stars are now 
doing webisodes and you know there is this sort of kind of odd little trickle down in the technological landscape which i think is occurring and it's i think it's going to change um again but right now i think we're in sort of a deflationary spiral and i think that that that's has a lot to do with cheap access to technology and the ability to crank out these things like reality tv or or even to crank out you know documentaries at a at a kind of faster more torrid pace I mean, even feature films, you know, everybody's doing you know, kind of assembly edits on the sets now, and, you know, they'll have a product out the door six weeks after wrap, so. We have brought up a really good thing. As far as advice, too, for filmmakers, there are a lot, there is a, a huge talent pool of people, actors who want to be working, and um, I don't have an extensive knowledge, but I do want to say that because actually one of the actresses in my film was on The Young and the Restless for years and was grateful to come out to Colorado and shoot a two-day film. And then I get an email from her about six months ago, guess what, I'm in a role opposite Tom Sizemore, you know, in a feature-length film. There is that kind of talent that is willing, you know, and it's not that expensive. I mean, you do have to make it, and the numbers work, but um, just again, that would be a bit of advice to filmmakers. I worked with Tom, Tom Sizemore, tell her to be careful. Yeah, sure, you told me a couple stories, but she's excited she's got some good stuff for her reel. Any other questions? Jason. There's a lot of juice in Boulder right now, a lot, and, you know, it's a great time to actually be here. Um, you know, Boulder survived the recession intact way better than other cities, and I think abundance always begets abundance, and, you know, it's drawn a whole new generation of innovators to... Um, to our city, so for sure. I see another question. Yes. We just have to give them the tools. These are digital age kids. I mean, as much of a geek as I am, my daughter can still get my iPad to do things that I can't at 12. You know, I mean, she's born with an iPad in her hand. So I'm like, well, how do I change this setting? Here, give it to me. You know, and and you, we, we don't give them the tools enough. And it begins, I, I just got, it was funny. Like, my daughter's extraordinarily social kid, like way too social. But we were, we went to get ice cream at the glacier after school. She's talking to this lady, la, 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 la. And, and I hear her saying, my mom's a filmmaker. And I hear the lady saying, oh, introduce me to your mom. She's working on a NASA-funded project that sounded similar to that Earth Explorers project. And she's, she's like, we need video mentors for this you know, NASA-funded thing that we're doing to get young, underrepresented you know, kids access to the tools of technology. But really just put this stuff in their hands. They will know what to do with it. That's what I say for this generation. I mean, the, it, there's never been a richer, we live in an embarrassment of riches in the camera side. There's never been cheaper, better cameras, I mean, in the history of ever, anywhere. You have a kid or a niece or a nephew, it's really helpful. It's fun, yeah, I mean, we've made the mystery of Uni Hill, and yeah, it, making films with kids is fun. I mean, it really is. If you've got a kid that's old enough to understand you know it's it's a lot of fun to make films with the kids but just you know there's no substitute there's a million contests out there there's the shootout there's all these things going on you know if you can't find a venue to make a film there's you know there's a problem but you know there's no better way to hone your craft than just do it and there's so many ways to do it now that you know you have to begin to pick and choose because there's so many opportunities and like coming places like this event with your business card and handing it out, especially to people that you hear about that have projects. We've got Cherry over here. We've got projects going on here. So just go up and introduce yourself. And um, again, just be willing to do whatever it takes to make that project happen. Well, um, I want to thank my incredible panelists here. Thank you so much, Todd, Karen, Miriam, and Danielle. Um, Bruce, thank you so much for asking me to put this together. Kira, thank you so much for all your help and making all this happen. Kenneth Watson, thank you for shooting this. And thank you, everyone, so much for coming and spending your evening here.